Howdy and welcome to the 10-week Bible study. This is a special series in the weeks leading up to Christmas on the Messianic prophecies found in the Old Testament. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and today we're talking about the cornerstone from Psalm chapter 118. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified when new episodes are uploaded. This is a five-day week Bible study to encourage you in your walk with the Lord. Howdy, I'm Darren Hibbs with the 10-week Bible study, and I'm so glad you're joining me today for this study. You know, the Messianic prophecies are are so amazing, and this is such a wonderful time of year as in the weeks leading up to Christmas to talk about these things. And this one is amazing because, to my knowledge, it's, if not the only, one of the very few messianic prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus directly quotes and addresses to the people. We'll look at that here in a little bit, but first, let's pray before we get started. Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears to hear what your word has to say to us today, God? Speak to us. We want to know more of you. We don't want to just know more about you, God, but we want to know you more. Come and touch us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that, let's jump into God's word. We'll be reading today from the NIV. This is Psalm 118, starting in verse 22. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. What a strange passage that this stone that's obviously talking about the Messiah, that this stone, the builders, the leaders of Israel, they've rejected the stone that should be the cornerstone. The cornerstone is that stone that's laid on top of the foundation or may even be the foundation stone and everything else radiates from that one place. And it doesn't matter how good your surveying is or how good any of your engineering or math is. If that cornerstone is not level and true and plumb and everything that it needs to be, everything else gets screwed up from there. And so it has to be this perfect stone that you start with. And so why on earth would it be marvelous for the builders, the leaders, to reject that perfect stone, for this one to come along and that they reject it, and it's the one that God has chosen as the cornerstone. This is not a good thing. So why does the psalmist say that we should be rejoice and be glad in the fact that the stone that the builders rejected, the leaders, they rejected it? It's actually the true cornerstone. Why is that a marvelous thing? I, I personally don't think this is necessarily saying, oh, how glorious that they rejected. I think it's marvelous and that we'll, we will marvel at how the leaders couldn't see this when God made it so clear. I think that's the kind of marveling we're talking about here. Let's go ahead and look at the passage where Jesus addresses this head on. He's going to tell the people a parable, and then he's going to make this abundantly clear. This is Luke chapter 20, starting in verse 9. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. So we can see here what the Lord is talking about, and and we actually find out when Jesus explains this parable to the disciples later that what he's talking about is he's talking about his vineyard is his people, Israel. And God is sending leaders along the way, He's sending prophets and people like that to the leaders, the tenants, the caretakers of the vineyard. He's sending prophets to instruct them and help them along the path, and they keep killing the prophets and mistreating the prophets and doing terrible things to them. And so Jesus makes it clear what this parable means, even though it's shrouded in a little bit of mystery here as he's telling it. Let's continue on. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. 
Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Jesus looked directly at them and said, And what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Jesus does go on after this to explain the parable to his disciples. And again, he says, you know, the, the people that came, they were the prophets that I sent to your leaders to bring correction. And now that the Son of God is here, the leaders are going to say, we're going to kill him. He is the cornerstone that the builders, the leaders have rejected. But God is going to make him the cornerstone. How did he do that? When the leaders thought they were killing him. God had other plans in mind. And not only did they not really <laughs> succeed in killing him because Jesus could have had, like it said, legions of angels come and rescue him. He gave up his life willingly. But not only did he die, but he rose from the dead. And in doing so, he became that cornerstone. He became that one that everyone that falls on him, they will be broken to pieces. And the connotation here, of course, is bad. We don't want to be broken to pieces or crushed. But this idea of being broken to pieces is something that I I think lends itself to an understanding that we can be put back together. But if that cornerstone falls on you, you're crushed. And so if you're in the way of that cornerstone, like these leaders are, God's going to come back and put that cornerstone in its place. Even though the Jesus tells in this parable because he's like, listen, you wounded and killed the prophets, but you're going to kill me and I'm the son of God. But God is going to bring me back as the cornerstone. He asked them point blank, what does this mean? They don't know. They don't know what he's talking about. They don't even know what that means because they're probably thinking the same way. It's like, how on earth can the Messiah dying be marvelous? And they don't get it. And so Jesus says, what does this mean? And he ties it directly to this parable. He is the one that they've rejected. He is the rejected cornerstone. But God is going to bring him back and make him the cornerstone, which he did when he was resurrected. We then inherited eternal life. Our sins are forgiven because Jesus died on the cross and we've been reconciled to God because Jesus as the firstborn of the dead will give us eternal life with God in his presence for all eternity. That is the cornerstone on which our faith is built. And that is what the Christmas season is truly about. This first advent of Jesus is not just about a baby laying in a manger where as marvelous and amazing as that is that God came in human form and and was laid in a feeding trough. That is amazing. But what goes beyond that is that he is this cornerstone. He was rejected by men while he was here, but God made him above every other person. He has glory and honor above everything else. And because of that, and because of the sacrifice that he made, we can be made right with God. That is what the Christmas season is about, is that there was a, that God became a man to save us from our sins. I pray that you and I can can spend some time reflecting and meditating on that this Christmas season during the hustle and bustle and maybe the church services that we go to, we can ponder and think about how amazing it is that God became a man. He was rejected by the builders, the leaders of the people at the time. Oh, that 
God would give us sight, that we would not be as blind as they were. Our natural proclivity is to be as blind as they were. We need the grace of God on our lives to see with clarity, to see who that cornerstone is. I pray that we will see with clarity this Christmas season. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs. Thanks for joining me on the 10-week Bible study today. I can't wait to see you next time.